Hey guys, Mr. David here. I hope you're having a great week. I cannot wait to jump into all of our lessons for today. But before we do that, I wanna play this really fun game. So I'm gonna play this video and you're gonna to try to guess what the fruit is. So there's gonna be come up with emojis and different pictures and you're gonna to try to guess what fruit they're trying to get you to say. So here we go. Wow, wasn't that fun? Some of them were hard, some of them were easy. I, I thought like the Blackberry one was a little easy. You may be wondering, Mr. David, why in the world are we doing these games? Why in the world are we talking about fruit? Why don't we talk, start talking about the Bible? Well, the Bible has a lot to say about something called the first fruits. You see, if you've ever grown a garden, or if you've ever seen a garden, you may know that fruits come in a lot of different times. So you plant it, and it, the plant grows, and the first things that come out, the tomatoes, or maybe the corn, or the peas, you go out and you collect them all, and then more grow out, and those would be the second fruits. There's a concept in the Bible, there's an idea in the Bible, that we should give God our best. Give God our first fruits because he is most important and he is worthy so what we are going to do is we're going to go into worship and we are going to give our god the first fruits of our hearts we're going to say god we will celebrate and worship you so stand up let's go into worship
Great job with that worship. Now we're going to go into our time of prayer. Prayer, we learned last week, is so important. God cares if we're in trouble, if we're hurting, or if there's something bad going on in our lives. He wants to hear about it, and He says He will help us. He also wants to hear about the good things in our lives. And just like last week where we wrote them down and put them in a, uh, put them our prayer planes together and threw our, pl- our prayer planes, this week we're going to spend time talking about those good things and we're going to send our prayers up to heaven as a class. So I want you to pause this video and spend time talking to God. Great job with that prayer. God loves it when we talk to Him and spend time with Him. And we should be spending time with Him every day, praying to Him every day, letting Him know that we love Him and care about Him. Now, we are going to go into our video lesson, and this lesson is about King Solomon and how King Solomon did something amazing with all the money that God had given him. And God blessed him for doing that. So let's watch this video. Solomon was the king of Israel after his father, David, died. God made Solomon very wise. Solomon began to build a temple for the Lord. Solomon ordered thousands of workers to help build the temple. They cut cedar logs and stone blocks. They laid a foundation and built the outside of the temple. God blessed the temple and promised Solomon 
If you obey my commands, I will keep the promise I made to David. I will live among the Israelites, and I will not abandon my people. The temple was built in seven years. It was beautiful. The cedar paneling inside the temple was carved with ornamental gourds and flower blossoms. Solomon overlaid everything inside the temple with pure gold. He hired men to make bronze furnishings for the temple, such as bronze bowls for holding water. When the temple was complete, Solomon moved the Ark of God from its place on Mount Zion to the new temple in Jerusalem. Solomon gathered the leaders of Israel. As the priests moved the Ark to the most holy place in the temple, King Solomon and the leaders sacrificed sheep and cattle to the Lord. When the priests came out of the temple, a cloud filled the temple. God's glory was in the cloud. Solomon turned to speak to the Israelites. Praise God, he said. God promised David that his son would build a temple. God kept his promise. Solomon stood and prayed with his hands spread out toward heaven. There is no God like you, he said. Then Solomon thought about the future. He knew Israel would sin and make God angry again. So Solomon asked for forgiveness and he asked God to hear their prayers. When Solomon had finished praying, he encouraged the Israelites to love and obey God. The people returned to their homes joyful because God was good to them. The temple was a place where God was good with his people. The people could go there to make sacrifices and worship God. Today, when we trust in Jesus, he is with us wherever we go. We can look to him for forgiveness and help. Wow, Solomon built this beautiful temple. The temple was like a house for God, almost like a church today. And, and he did it with, uh, wow, what a cool story. You see, Solomon built that beautiful temple. A temple is almost like a church today. And, and God was said to live there. That that's where God lived. Now we know today we are the temple. God lives inside of us. His Holy Spirit lives inside of us. But at that point, God lived in that temple. And Solomon so badly wanted to worship God and make a beautiful home for him. So he used his money. He used Israel's money to build this beautiful house for God. And that's a great reminder for us that God is the most important thing. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in in what we want and what we think we need and that we can forget that we need to be giving and loving and giving our best things to God. Now you may be saying, Mr. David, I don't make money. I I can't help build a temple. But you know what? Some of the most important things don't come from money. Giving money to God's important, and we're actually going to have an opportunity to do that here in a minute. But giving our best to God means giving Him the time He deserves. Giving Him, or making sure that we are being loving and kind to other people. Making sure that even when it makes our lives, it feels like it makes our lives harder, that we're giving to Him everything that we should be. Maybe it's taking time instead of watching TV to read your Bible, to pray. Maybe it's inviting that friend over to sit with you at lunch that that doesn't have a whole lot of friends. You see, we can give to God in a lot of ways. Let's check our memory verse. James 5.2 Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Oh, man, that's crazy, isn't it? Moths eating your clothes. We don't really have that problem as much anymore, but it used to be a big problem in houses that moths would get in and they'd they'd chew on your clothes and they ruin clothes. And what the Bible's telling us here, what James is telling us here, is that the things of this earth do not last. Money doesn't last. Clothes don't last. Toys don't last. Nothing on this earth will last. The only thing that lives forever is us with God. 
God is the only thing that can that can go forever. And it's important for us to put our money in the right places. So we're getting ready to have an opportunity to give money. Mr. Anyway and his wife, Megan, started a ministry called Redeem All Ministries. And they're getting ready to go to Zimbabwe. And they're going to be raising up preachers, teaching people how to go and tell other people about God. So this is a great opportunity for us to give the first fruits of our labor to God. So, I'm going to pause this video. I want you to do your offering time and think about what it means to be giving our money to God. Awesome. Now we are going to go into a time of communion. Communion is a, a way for us to remember what God has done for us. Remember that Jesus died on the cross. He took away our sins, that his blood was spilled for us, and that's why we have the juice, and his body was broken for us. His skin was broken for us on the cross, and that saves us from our sins. Have you ever wondered why every once in a while at church, people eat a small piece of bread and drink a tiny bit of juice? Is it just snack time, or is there more to it than that? Well, this has a lot of different names, but for today, we'll call it communion. And communion is something that the church has done for thousands of years. But what exactly is communion? Why do we do it? To answer that, we should look all the way back at the very first communion. Before Jesus went to the cross, he had one last meal with his disciples. While they were all there, Jesus took a cup and told his disciples to divide it among themselves. Then he broke up some bread into smaller pieces and gave a piece to each of his disciples. When Jesus had them all take and eat the bread, he said, this is my body. The bread represented his body that would be broken. When they all took the cup, Jesus told them, this is my blood. The cup represented his blood that was going to be poured out as a sacrifice for them on the cross. When they ate the bread and drank the cup, he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. This is why we take communion, to remember Jesus and what he did for us. The bread and the cup are physical symbols that Jesus gave us to remind ourselves of something much bigger that he did for us. So let's talk about the bread for a second. This isn't the first time that Jesus compared himself to bread. In John 6:48, he said, I am the bread of life. What he meant by that was, just like our physical bodies need food to stay alive, our spirits need food too. Otherwise, they'll starve. When we eat the bread, we should remember that just like physical food sustains our physical lives, Jesus sustains us spiritually. Without Jesus, our spiritual bread, we would starve. Also, just like the bread that he broke and handed to his disciples, his body was about to be broken. Because Jesus' body was broken, they could be made whole. The same is true for us. When we eat the bread, we should remember that Jesus' body was broken the day he went to the cross. Because of that, we can have healing, not just physical healing, but emotional healing and spiritual healing as well. Jesus was broken, just like the bread, so that we could be made whole. Now, let's talk about that cup. Back before Jesus came to earth, when people sinned, the only way to be right with God was to sacrifice an animal that had no imperfections. That may sound kind of weird, but that's how seriously God views sin. The Bible says that the cost of sin is death. So every time they sinned, they had to sacrifice another animal, and even still, they weren't changed on the inside. But all of those sacrifices with their emphasis on blood were a picture of the real sacrifice that would be coming and would change people from the inside. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. When we drink the cup, we should remember that it is only because of Jesus' blood that we are able to be born again into God's family. Without Jesus' sacrifice, we would be doomed to be separated from God forever because of our sin. So the bread and the cup are just a physical way to remind us of the amazing thing that Jesus did for us. First and foremost, communion is a time to remember. Remember what Jesus did for you. Remember that only he can sustain you spiritually and that his body was broken so that you could be made whole. Also, remember that his blood was spilled to pay the price for your sins so that you could be a part of God's family. Communion is also a time to examine ourselves. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11:28 that we should examine ourselves before we take communion. Communion's a serious deal. We need to take it with the right attitude. This is a good time to ask yourself questions like, is there something that I need to ask forgiveness for? If so, 
now's the time to do that. Or maybe ask yourself, am I living a life that brings honor to the broken body and the blood that Jesus spilled for me? If not, take the time to ask forgiveness and commit to living a life that brings honor to Jesus before taking communion. Communion is a great time to examine ourselves. Lastly, communion is a time for community. A lot of times when we take communion, we use pre-prepared, already broken up pieces of bread rather than using one singular loaf of bread that we split up. So it's easy to forget the significance of the picture that we are all a part of one body, the body of Christ. Because Christ's body was broken, we can all be united in that one body, no matter who we are. Young or old, big or small, rich or poor, if we've made Jesus our Lord, we are bound together as one body. It's the broken body and the blood of Jesus that binds us together as a family. So communion is a time to remember what Jesus did for us. It's a time to examine ourselves on whether we're living a life that honors Jesus or not. And it's a time for community. Remember that no matter what background you come from, when we're a part of God's family, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Guys, I hope you remember that everything we have is God's. I hope you remember that, like Solomon, we can, we can do amazing things for God and that God will bless us if we chase after Him, if we do His will. And that we can know that when we're doing things for God, that's going to be our greatest joy and that's going to bring us the most joy. I hope you guys remember to give back to God this week. Spend time with Him. Give money financially to Him. And that, that you, you remember that He loves you and He cares about you and that He wants what's best for you. I hope you remember that I love you. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye.